Well, Jack, we're going to uh, turn to another subject here, and I, by way of introduction, I just want to say I've, I've known you for about 14 years. I didn't know for the first several years that we knew each other uh, mm -hmm. of your military yeah. experience and your experience in Vietnam. It always uh, has struck me as as odd. Right, that's you, how that's how everybody. <laughs> because I mean, you people who know you know you as a very gentle soul. I think is a fair. Uh, partial characterization of you and the, and the notion of well, you being... You know, I, I'm uh, now uh, a pacifist, so that does make it a little bit odd. Okay. But not as a general soul. Um, I'm, and I learned this line from Stan Hirawas, who's been a bit of a... He's a theologian at Duke, who's been a bit of a mentor. The reason I'm a, a pacifist is it stops me from killing people. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you see, I... I I'd have to violate a principle and that I can't do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so the, uh, beneath this uh, exterior there beats the, the heart of one not so gentle, you're trying to tell me? Probably. Yeah. Um, I'm not a veteran. Yeah. And so I, 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 um, uh, it, it's harder for me to uh, imagine, you know, what, what it must have been like for you. So I'm just going to just open it up for you okay. to explain to me what what you did, mm -hmm. uh, what it was like, what influence it had on you uh, later in life. Yeah, that's... Um, if any. The surprising thing is that I, it just, it's, you know, I get this question all the time. Um, in fact, um, I was just interviewed, I think I mentioned this to you in an email. I was interviewed on Veterans Day for a... Um, student magazine. It's more of a blog, but it's also a magazine. It goes out around the country. I think the ages are something like um, fourth grade to tenth or something along those lines. And, uh, <clears throat> and they wanted to know about being a veteran. And they wanted to know about Vietnam and how do you thank veterans and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, and that's just the latest in <laughs> a series of uh, people asking me about the Vietnam experience. And I appreciate people being interested in it, sort of a way of um, a country making peace with its Vietnam vets, <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but Vietnam, I, I'm a strange one to interview on that. It was not traumatic for me. It wasn't... Uh, uh, a central experience as it was for so many people. Um, so I got, I think I already told you the story about how I kind of stumbled into mm -hmm. the Marine Corps and my uh, junior year at Duke go off to uh, uh, what's called Bulldog, which is the office's equivalent of Paris Island and it's very physically demanding. Paris Island is there to form you into uh, being, beginning the formation of being a Marine. Bulldog is the same, but uh, formation of being a Marine officer. And I'm sure that those experience were shaping experience. I'm just not conscious of how they were shaping. Um, and then after that, we come back, we had a, a gunnery sergeant um, at Duke who was with the Navy ROTC. He was the only Marine there. And he's getting us ready to go to the basic school. All Marines, all Marine officers go to something called the basic school. It's six months at Quantico. It's to turn you into a Marine officer again. That, um, yeah, that's intense too, in a different <coughs> way, but that's intense too. Uh, so the gunny is going to get us ready to go to the basic school, and what that meant was that those of us who were taking the Marine Corps option, the Navy lets 10% do that, um, we'd go out and run. We'd go out and run the golf course and through the woods and everything else um, with boots on, <laughs> which is probably why my knees hurt now. Uh, we'd do that two or three times, and we were running five or six miles uh, two or three times a week, and then... Uh, at the end, he would make us do all sort of, uh, we'd do push-ups, we'd sit-ups, and you're doing this at the end of five, six-mile run. 
And then, and sometimes he'd have us wrestle with each other at the end of this, which was extremely unpleasant. <laughs> um, so anyhow, the, the gunny is getting us ready to go to the basic school. By that point, I had begun to have second uh, thoughts about all of this. And I did some research on the war, and I was hearing all the protests about the war, and um, I came to my own conclusion that the, that this war was uh, a bad mistake. Morally wrong, yeah. Um, was it morally wrong in a way distinguishable from other wars? Uh, that's a Catholic question. Um, it certainly wasn't, in Catholic terms, a just war. I didn't fall under any of the criteria. Um, so yeah, probably morally wrong. Most of those who were protesting against a war were to protest against any war. It wouldn't, uh, they, they wouldn't have made distinctions. <coughs> and I join them in that now. Um, there's, a, there's a price to pay for that. And the price is that others have to die then for your belief <laughs> in, in certain war situations. And that's hard to accept. Almost contrary to the, your own motivation for being opposed to war. Though it, it's still troubling. But I, I had come to the conclusion the war was wrong and I wanted to get at, find a way to get out, but I, I couldn't really find a way that was acceptable. Um, I go to the basic school and I'm haunted by this. Mm -hmm. uh, every time they would use, and it's Marine Corps for goodness sakes, and the language in there is very, very violent. So whenever you'd study a particular weapon, grenades for example, you'd look at the different killing radius of the different kinds of grenades and, and so forth, and I, and I would think, killing radius? <laughs> I don't really want to kill anybody. <laughs> this is, what am I doing here? Yeah. Now, it, I, I mean, you could, I, I told this story to my son many, many years later, and he said, well, you were just a coward. And I said, yeah, you're probably right. There were ways out. You could tell uh, the Marine Corps that um, uh, you had religious objections to the war. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't know how that would work. Um, I, I wasn't going to flee. I wasn't going to go to Canada. I wasn't going to do any of that. I knew I wasn't going to do any of that. But uh, I didn't take the initial step to say, this war is wrong and I want out. I didn't do it. So what did I do? Well, <laughs> tried to finagle it, both actually and then morally. Uh, the actual was this. They gave us a language aptitude test. They give this to all the officers it's to see who should be trained in various languages. And I just, I have to say, I blew it away. Um, really, what they do is they make up a language and see how quickly you can learn it. And I, and, I, and I loved taking the test, I thought it was fascinating, and it did really well. So I get called in, Sam, as you have done, exceptional in this test, and you really have a unique ability there. And, there are many things that you should consider in your Marine Corps career and so forth and so on. So I thought about that. Well, that's, that's the ticket. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the major that was the head of our company and I'm going to request being transferred after basic school to Vietnamese language school and then I'll go over to Vietnam as a translator. Nothing wrong with that, <laughs> you know. Um, and it would be terribly interesting for me. <laughs> So I go in to see the major, and uh, he said, I put in that, and he said, well, um, Lieutenant, you really did well on this test. And later on in your Marine Corps career, you should go to language school. There's no doubt about that. But I'm not sending you to language school until you snuff a few gooks. Those were his words. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. I, am I in the wrong place here? So now, that now, didn't. The, let me ask you about that. The, the, the language school would solve the moral problem. Because no, you, not the moral problem, the practical problem. Well, I was going to ask you about both of them. I mean, it, 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 as a translator, you're not killing people. Mm -hmm. um, it's still a dangerous thing oh, to I do. I don't care about. I, 
I, honestly, it was not the danger. Okay, so, and that's what I was getting, I mean, this wasn't, no matter what Lanier said, this isn't cowardice. It's a different kind of, it's a moral cowardice, okay. is what he's talking about. And that comes in the second part, okay. as much as anything. So I thought, well, how are you going to reconcile this to yourself? Um, I came up with a way in Vietnam of reconciling it. I'll tell you about that in a little while. But I thought this, this will sound terribly silly and terribly academic, too. Um, I thought, well, look, this is one of the world's most interesting experiences, being a soldier in, a, in wartime, being a Marine in wartime, even more so. This particular war, probably even more interesting that way because we don't know what we're doing, <laughs> and, um, and and it it was it was viewed with as such horror. There was an expression at the time that people would use in the military, uh, especially in the Marine Corps, when you're about to do something that you knew that the uh, higher ups wouldn't approve. You'd say, "Well, what are they going to do? Send me to Vietnam?" <laughs> In other words, it couldn't be anything any worse. <laughs> You're already doing that. So uh, I thought this is this is this is an opportunity. This opportunity experience uh, something terribly, terribly interesting. I'm going to go for that reason, and I'm going to go. I guess as a reporter, uh, I'm going to watch all of the stuff and I'm going to write it up. <laughs> so I contacted a professor at UNC um, I knew something about. And he was, uh, he was in the English department and he taught playwriting um, and said, any way that I can just sign up for a course in playwriting, I'd like to, while I'm in Vietnam, write a play <laughs> about the experience. And he said, yes, I'd love for you to do that. I said, okay. So I signed up for this playwriting course, and when I first got over there, I'm carrying around, where did I put my little booklet? I'm carrying around, uh, as I have ever since, uh, a little booklet, just to, to write down thoughts and to write down what I say and so forth and so on. I've got maybe 2,000 of these things. Um, and uh, so that was kind of the, <laughs> my uh, fudge. Um, justification, uh, I, I'm not really there. <laughs> uh, I'm, it's, it's the one that reporters use. I'm, I'm not really there, mm -hmm. I'm just watching. But this is in your mind. I mean, this it is in my mind. This isn't what the Marine Corps is telling you to no, do. No, goodness, no. Goodness, no. Um, well, I, that wasn't going to work. There wasn't any time. The conditions weren't good for, for writing. For writing, uh, I tried it for a while, and I sent off materials to him, and he liked what he was seeing, but I eventually had to abandon it, and he uh, made me promise to come back to it, but I never did, because I didn't want to go back over the stuff. But what happened was, I was in Dong Ha, I was assigned to the 3rd Marine Division in Dong Ha. That's just south of the DMZ along Route 9. It's the uh, supply route, uh, for all the way to the end is Quezon, and then there's um, LZ Stud, Camp Carroll, Contian, uh, all of the hot spots in the war in the north were there. And, and my job was uh, to protect convoys along the route. So that's what my men were doing, essentially, protecting convoys along the route. So coming up from the south with supplies for the troops. Well, we would pick it up at Dong Ha. North. Okay. Because so it comes up through Wei to Dong Ha, and then we'd pick it up on okay. out. Uh, and we would be uh, riding these uh, quad 50s. It's a, it's a truck with uh, four machine guns, essentially, mounted on it. And uh, we'd have a mine truck in front of us, and then the troop truck, and so forth and so on. So we were mostly... Um, there to protect against ambushes. It was mostly a defensive posture. I mean, occasionally when we'd get some intelligence, uh, we could call in airstrikes in anticipation, things like that. But mostly it was a defensive posture. Well, that suited me well. 
Um, because now, and I think this happens to almost all military people in war, it didn't no longer matter what the war was about. It just didn't matter at all. I didn't even have those thoughts. It was, my job is to protect my men. Mm -hmm. There are people here that are trying to kill my men. It doesn't matter why they're trying to kill my men. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let them kill my men. This is a situation in which I found myself. Mm -hmm. Am I to blame for being here? Yeah. But it's a situation in which I found myself. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely clear to me for all sort of reasons that uh, doing uh, almost whatever I could to stop them from being killed um, was justification enough for me. It got simpler. So I think that happens to... Um, all military people. Mm -hmm. you, it becomes about the people next to you, mm -hmm. not about the war, not about the politics, n not about anything else. Not about the grand domino theory of communist domination. It's about the person in that truck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, towards the, and that's what I did most of the time, was run those convoys. Towards the end, uh, I had various positions, m moved up, and uh, then I didn't like being in the office and having increased responsibility. And I did some of the intelligence reporting and things like that, and uh, none of those were particularly appealing. But towards the end of my tour, um, I got assigned to be responsible for the battalion civic action programs. And this was reaching out to the Vietnamese people to help them in any way that we could. So I set up what were called medcaps where we took uh, doctors and corpsmen. Uh, corpsmen are, are medics but they're in the Navy and the Navy provides the corpsmen to the Marine Corps into the villages uh, to treat various illnesses of one kind or another. And, I, and uh, that was very re rewarding and I loved doing it. Um, the kids were wonderful. The most it was mostly kids. The parents would be out in the rice fields and the older kids would be responsible for the younger kids. Um, I've got some pictures um, from that time and um, I'll send one to you to mention about, I'll send one to you what I look like and so forth. Mm -hmm. But um, they didn't, the Vietnamese, at least in the north, didn't like their picture being taken because they thought that that captured their spirit, uh, which is terribly interesting to me at the time and I thought about this and have thought about it um, ever since. There's, a, there's some truth in that. It's actually a, a Heideggerian truth <laughs> which we probably won't get to but I, it, it just fascinated me. I thought about it and I talked with all sorts of people about mm -hmm. that. Um, so I didn't get pictures, there are some pictures of the kids uh, with their permission and so mm -hmm. forth. And, didn't get much in the way of pictures. One of the, the other things that we did, there are an awful lot of Montagnard. Montagnard are the mountain people in Vietnam. They had no dog in the fight <laughs> in the war. They just got caught in between. Um, they just wanted to uh, farm their lands and chew betel nut. Mm -hmm. Betel nut is sort of a narcotic and it would stain and ruin their teeth, and, uh, but they would chew it incessantly. Um, there were an awful lot of kids with cleft uh, palates and cleft lips, mm -hmm. mostly cleft lips, not palate. And those kids were shunned by the villagers. They'd be born, they'd have a cleft palate, nobody wanted anything to do with them other than the, uh, their parents. They were thought to be, um, to have some evil spirit within them. Marked in some marked. way. Yeah. They were, yeah, mark of the devil, I guess, of some sort. Those are easy to fix, easy for doctors to fix. And fortunately, there were a couple of Navy doctors there that were interested in it. And we set up, we went out and looked for these kids and talked with their parents and we'd bring them back into Dong Ha. The, the parents would stay in tents overnight and they would uh, perform, the doctors would perform these surgeries. That was an awful lot because these are mountain people that are not inclined to trust you. And to turn their kids over and to go mm -hmm. live somewhere else for a while was amazing that they could, uh, that they were willing to do that, but they did. So we did an awful lot of uh, 
repairs. I would then meet with villagers. Uh, I had a translator who uh, tried to locate, but I think he was, after we left, he was probably killed uh, for his work with me. Uh, everybody knew who he was and that he was working with me. He was a delightful guy, and I got to know his family, and we'd go into their, he would invite me over, and we'd have these meals with his family and everything else, and I would steal things for him. <laughs> Concrete, and, you know, things like that. Work it out. I say steal, but I work it out with this, the, the person who really do stealing was the uh, a lieutenant in charge of supplies, and I just convinced him to do it. <laughs> okay. you know? um, and a good cause, Jack. Yeah. So uh, we'd go into these uh, villages and find out what their needs were and see if we could meet them. Sometimes we were going to pay for water buffalo that got shot by mistake. Um, the villagers would come up and they'd know very little English, but they would know boom, boom, water buffalo, meaning that you'd kill my water buffalo and that we'd pay for the water buffalo. Um, some of the villages, we didn't know whether to trust them or not, so we pull up to the road leading into the village and he would have arranged through various communication channels for them to know that we were going to be there and we'd have the village chief come out and ride with us into the village and if the village chief wouldn't do that we wouldn't go in mm -hmm. because the way that the Kong would have um, dealt with this is um, by mining the road at the time that we were going to go in so we knew if he was going to go uh, in the jeep with mm -hmm. us, that um, no, we'd go in and they had rice threshers they needed. They had uh, horrible uh, um, sewage systems. We could help with that. We could uh, uh, provide uh, water filtering and um, all sort of things. So that was really good. That mm -hmm. that part of it was really rewarding. And uh, then I got back from, uh, but again, this was not a traumatic experience. I've met so many veterans for whom Vietnam was a traumatic experience. Did I see people getting blown up? Yes. Um, there was uh, one Jeep carrying a, a Marine Major. We were out in the boonies and um, we weren't. We had called in the mine sweeping team to sweep the road before we headed out. Uh, he jumped the gun in, intentionally, um, took off his jeep, hit a mine, got blown up. And I remember that one vividly because it was so horrific. And in, um, I had trouble calling in the medevac, and uh, that has haunted me <laughs> more than anything mm -hmm. else, I guess. Um, trying to call in the medevac and the, the, uh, the, the uh, radio not working and having to find ways around <laughs> it and the like. And the, the Marine Corps then is not like the Marine Corps now. I've had some contacts with the Marine Corps now. I've testified in some hearings about things in uh, Iran. Um, and it's a, the Marine Corps now is so much better than it was then. They're so much better organized. They're so okay. much better trained. They, uh, the rules of engagement are so strict and so mostly adhered to and respected. And uh, we didn't, I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't know what rules of engagement were. Um, so it, the Marine Corps is a different world now. It's a mm -hmm. much better world. It's a much better, in many many ways. Can I ask you? You saw some things that I think would be traumatic for most people. Um, why didn't they bother me? Yeah. Well, it's not, I know, it's not, that's not a fair way to phrase it, but uh, it wasn't traumatic for you long term, although you, you talked about that one event. You have any clue why not? No, not really. I mean, they, I, I, mean they, I had some of the uh, lingering effects that others did. Yeah. So when I, was, when I got out of the Marine Corps, this, this was one that stands out in my mind because it was so public. I got out of the Marine Corps, I went out to Houston, Texas, because I had a friend from Duke who was there and spent the summer out there, not all the summer, but uh, helping him in a rice farm. But mostly we were just playing music and getting drunk at night. Um, 
right before law school. So I go to law school and I'm in the law library and suddenly there's a, a plane that's coming over and it sounded like incoming. It sounded like an incoming mortar round. It's exactly like that. Well, I, I, I didn't think about it. I just dove under the table immediately. Mm -hmm. And then all these people looking at me, like people now look at, <laughs> at some Vietnam uh, veterans, mm -hmm. and uh, what's this guy going to do? You know, right. it's like they're time bombs waiting to explode. And, uh, but I got up and I walked out of the library and calmed down. Mm -hmm. And another one that, and show you how long those kind of effects linger, Jim Marshall, who you know, taught at the law school, former mayor, congressman. Um, Jim was uh, in Vietnam the same time I was, but he was in the South. He was um, a general's kid who had been enlisted and uh, Jim was very intense and was going to win the war single-handedly. Um, he was kind of a renegade um, fighter, soldier. He formed his own group and they'd go out at night. Um, his, his was more a heart of darkness <laughs> kind of uh, an apocalypse now type uh, um, experience. Um, well, anyhow, uh, Jim and I are both teaching in law school. We're walking up the back stairs together. We got to the top of the stairs, and there's, as you know, the one next to the elevator, there's a door there that goes into the faculty area. You know the one I'm talking about, right. the little, little elevator? Well, that door is almost always locked. And if you don't want to take the elevator and you come up the stairs, then you have to knock on the door to get somebody to let you in. Somebody had taken the door and tied it open. And, they, uh, and it was tied you know, on a long string going down. So Jim and I are walking up the stairs and we see this string. And I did like that and he did like that and we both started backing away. It just immediate mm -hmm. because it looked like a tripwire. Yeah. And I hadn't thought about a tripwire in I don't know how many years, but it's there in your mind. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in your brain. It, it's, it's in your brain. I'm just not conscious of it. Um, so I, I, I don't know why it wasn't, uh, it didn't bother me, but it, it didn't bother me. And um, uh, like I say, I don't, the, the, uh, the, that's nothing special of, about me. The, there's so many uh, Vietnam vets for whom it was traumatic and it shaped their lives. And right. I know some of those folks and the various uh, groups that I've worked with that uh, uh, work with uh, Vietnam vets, um, but it just it just wasn't that way for me. I have to say that if I had to uh, summarize it in a single word, and this sounds almost uh, cruel, I guess, in some ways, it was just interesting. <laughs> it was just really interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because that's the word you used in describing, you know, before you went. Uh, I was going to ask you if in, in the end, you, know, you just answered it, that you found it that way. And I guess a, a, a funny way of asking this is, are you glad you went? I, I don't know, Pat. That's, I think that's um, some ways an impossible question. Yeah, I, I don't, once it's like eudaimonia, um, the Greek word for life well lived, you don't, you only know if your life has been eudaimonic when you look back over the end of it. Well, looking back over things, I've been so incredibly blessed. Um, things have gone <laughs> so well for me um, through, it seemed to me, little doing of my own. Um, back to my uncle, I asked him once after I was a lawyer, I said, Wilbin, to what do you attribute your success in the practice of law? He said, luck. <laughs> and I thought, oh, he's just being modest. No, I understand. Mm -hmm. understand. And uh, so I, the, it, I've been so blessed that I can't disassociate that life from any of the experiences mm -hmm. within it. So if I didn't go to Vietnam, this wouldn't have happened in this and so forth right. and so on. So, it's yeah. an impossible question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how long were you over there? Uh, 12 and 20, 12 months and 20 days. 
Okay. That was the standard tour. Okay. But who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> um, you owed the Marine Corps four years? Six. Six years. Four years active. Two four years, years active. active reserve. Okay. Came back. I was stationed in uh, Albany, Georgia. Um, I was the uh, training, in charge of training um, initially. Then I was head of the company later on. Oh, it, there wasn't much um, in Albany. Um, by that time, my attitude towards war was pretty clear, and uh, I was eager to get out of the Marine Corps. I used, uh, I had, it, it wasn't demanding work at Albany. Uh, I got involved in a lot of things in the city. I did little theater work. I uh, uh, loved that. I performed in several mm -hmm. plays, um, and I loved that. Uh, I wrote songs for a rock band <clears throat> called, this was before other people stole the phrase, but it was called Rolling Thunder. And the reason why it's Rolling Thunder is because it, it had two drummers and there were almost no rock bands around that had two drummers. So I was writing music for them and occasionally performing. Um, so I was sort of in the, more in the little arts community there in Albany and felt more a part of that. Marine Corps was at that point just my job during the right. day. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it wasn't like it's been in recent years where you see repeat deployments. Uh, uh, that's a huge difference. It's, um, I wouldn't mind, I didn't want to go back to Vietnam, but I wanted to go to Japan and requested, as I was leaving Vietnam, I requested going to Japanese duty. I was curious about Japanese duty, but the Marine Corps wanted me back mm -hmm. here. So. Okay. So you're in Albany for how long? Um, Gosh, I guess it was almost two years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And is that when your active duty time ended yeah. in Albany? An active reserve doesn't mean much. Yeah. Um, so between then and starting law school, do we have a, is there a, a time in there that? It's, we, it's just, uh, uh, it's a period of about three, four months. Right. So that's it, when it's I went rice out farming and drinking right, right, right. at night. But that, really, uh, that was, Reed McRoberts, who had been a dear friend of mine, and he was more of a music buddy than anything else. Mm -hmm. So, and I was really into music at the time because I was writing this music for um, these bands. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, it was mostly an excuse to go out and be with Reed and do music in the evenings. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before that law school was just um, by default. Yeah. You know? Um, knew I wanted to get back to school. Right. Yeah. What else did you think about doing besides law school? You mentioned there were some other possibilities. Well, I, I, uh, I was pretty sure I wanted to write. Yeah. Um, and that could take a variety of forms. Um, I thought about going back and getting a degree in literature um, and then maybe teaching. Um, I thought about being a reporter. Mm -hmm. I was interested in journalism. Um, but I, again, I, it, unless I went back and took some other courses, those didn't seem to be grad schools that made a great deal of sense for me. So I just kind of stumbled into it. But there's another part to that. It was, I didn't want to be any further financial burden on my parents. I was old enough by then, so I should be on my own. Well, um, I could go to law school in state, because I was at Albany at the time. I could go to the University of Georgia. I could get a uh, veteran's benefit. And it wasn't going it was like to it wasn't going to cost me anything. I'd have money coming in. Uh, the uh, the uh, Veterans Administration at that time was giving me four or five hundred dollars a month to go to school. Mm -hmm. No tuition. They gave me a job during the summer. My first job the summer, uh, everybody else going off to law firms. I worked at a golf course. <laughs> 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 and did almost nothing <laughs> really at the golf course. It was the university golf course. Helped them set up a tournament maybe. That's about uh, pick up balls at the driving range, things like that. So that was a summer devoted to reading. The uh, First year of law school, as you know, and everyone knows, is so intense that you can't do any reading other mm -hmm. than legal reading. Mm -hmm. I spent 
the entire summer of eating a golf course, uh, being paid by the government. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and much later, uh, used uh, golf as one of your many examples of uh, practices. And, yeah. you know, uh, that, that was on your mind that summer, but uh, no. that came later. No, yeah. And really, in, in law school, the, the serious thought was uh, to become an environmental lawyer. Okay. I didn't know exactly what that meant. Just like so many of our kids at, mm -hmm. at law school coming in, say, they used to say, I don't know if they still do, they want to be environmental lawyers, but they picture themselves working outside. <laughs> 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 and don't realize that most environmental lawyers represent the side, yeah. the other side. Yeah. So, you know. Although compliance work can be, as you know, really rewarding work mm -hmm. too. Um, but they didn't realize the kind of regulations that they'd be dealing with. Some mm -hmm. of the most boring regulations in the world, mm -hmm. environmental regulations. Well, tell me about law school for you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, uh, you come to it um, not as what uh, our mutual friend Jim Elliott calls a straight through. Right. You didn't mm -hmm. go straight through college mm -hmm. and then start law school. You come with the, some uh, some real experiences behind you. Well, yeah, I, and I felt older. Um, there were a couple of other uh, veterans there, um, including, oh, hell, I'm not going to be able to come up. Mike, he was the attorney general. Uh, Mike Bowers? Mike Bowers. Uh, and Mike and I were, uh, and ran for governor, and then there was a bit, yeah. So uh, Mike and I, uh, were there as veterans, there are a couple of others as well. I made some good friends at the law school. Um, I formed um, Environmental Law Society there, got it started, um, along with some people that I recruited They were interested in environmental law. We worked on a Spruill Bluff Dam issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want the dam, and it was finally an environmental impact statement, which was new law at the time. We put together uh, an objection to the environmental impact statement that was that had been done, um, but filed it administratively. We didn't know enough to, as to how to object to it legally, uh, but Carter eventually backed off and supported our position on it. Um, so I, law school. Well, I got, I, I got married uh, towards the end of my first year. Um, there were only six women in our class. Oh. And uh, so it, it was, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of competition. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Laney uh, then, as I mentioned earlier, withdrew mm -hmm. from law school and uh, Sorrel came along. And so she became mother mm -hmm. and Laney has gone off to her own fame lately. We, we can mention that later too. Yeah, right? we're going we're gonna to talk about that now and I do want to talk about that part of your law school experience in just a minute. But let me, let me ask you a, a much more open-ended question. Did you like law school? I mean, did you enjoy, I mean, intellectually, oh, I academically, I mean, you loved Duke. No, so no, I didn't love it. Um, it's not the same. It, it wasn't the same. There were times when it was the same. I studied with Pat Kane. I don't know if you know Pat. Mm -hmm. uh, Pat is a law professor. And, uh, she was in Iowa for many years. Uh, where is Pat now? Oh, I'm not sure where, um, where she went. Um, Pat was absolutely brilliant. And uh, uh, she was my study partner and that was good. That part of it was good. Um, but no, I didn't really love it. I started working with, there wasn't a Balsa, but there was the Balsa equivalent. Mm -hmm. And the, um, some of the black students were struggling. Um, so there were a couple that I latched on to and we would uh, work together. I enjoyed, I enjoyed mm -hmm. that. Uh, and, and like I say, they were good friends, but it wasn't the academic experience for me that Duke had been. When I first got to the law school and got into the library, and I looked at, there weren't shelves like these. It was, it was just case books. Oh my God, have I screwed up. <laughs> these books, the covers all look the same. <laughs> but I found 
and the things that did interest me. And uh, having this environmental theme, which disappears, I'll jump ahead, but it disappeared, not as an interest, but just as a potential career. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that disappeared. So that, but there were things that I was interested in. And whenever we were called upon to write papers, which wasn't often, I enjoyed enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You met Laney. Yeah. Tell, tell me about that. How did you all meet? Um, we went to a, uh, um, there were four, four or five of us that went to a movie together. It was Song of the South. You remember the song? <laughs> I do. It, it had just come back, and, they, and we said, let's go see Song of the South. Um, so we went there, and she was more with a friend of mine, Chris Calhoun, and I was more with this uh, other woman. But anyhow, we got to know each other that way and then <laughs> went out to dinner, I think, that evening. And then later on, we went to a, a political event. Um, this was back when uh, Jean McCarthy, mm -hmm. I think it was. And the local Democratic committee was trying to decide who they were going to support and so forth and so on. Um, I'm not really into politics. I, it, I, I do my best not to think politically. It's hard not to in our culture. <laughs> but I try very hard not to. Um, and one of the things I like about law is that it pulls you away from it. I think that's a very good thing. Um, but anyhow, at the time, that seemed like a good thing to do. And so we started dating and uh, were together from pretty much from um, then on. And that's how many years ago? Oh, gosh. Well, we got married in 72. Okay. So, so it's working out so far for yeah, you? Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Still on my first wife. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and you mentioned your daughter was born while you were in law school. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, that sets you apart from most of the law students as well. You, you're a grown-up family man. Yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. There weren't many others, mm -hmm. actually. Now that I think about it, mm -hmm. there were a few older students, but. Mm -hmm. you know. And of course, it meant that my time was scarce. I didn't have time for much of anything else. Right. And, now, were you, when you were in law school, some law students are and some aren't, but were, were you focused on a career ambition, a career? I thought goal? I was when I first got there. I okay, and that's the environmental, environmental law, law thing. Yeah. And by the time you finished? Yeah, no, it wasn't that. I had, uh, I got involved in the clinic. There wasn't much of a clinic, but there was a bit of a clinic there. Mm -hmm. I got involved in the clinic, and that was a formative experience. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, so that pushed me in a different direction, mm -hmm. and I, uh, and that also made sense to me. I didn't know what the environmental law route right. meant. Hard to and there was nobody there to advise me. Mm -hmm. The one, uh, Sherrod, I think his name was Professor Sherrod, who was interested in environmental law towards, but he left. And there was really no one that mm -hmm. could say, well, if you want to be an environmental mm -hmm. lawyer, this is, uh, as you know, right now, you want to be an environmental lawyer, it's it, compliance work, because governmental jobs are such in demand that it's almost impossible to get them. That wasn't true back then. It was mm -hmm. developing the EPA, the EPD. There was a chance to do it. I didn't know how. Right. But I, uh, through the uh, clinic, I, uh, I got a sense of how this could work if I was going to do legal services work. Mm -hmm. So I became terribly interested in legal services and. Mm -hmm. um, let me, I want to focus on something you just said. You said that being in the clinic was a formative experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, um, that's a powerful word, especially mm -hmm. these days as we think about the formation of professionals. Well, it, I no longer could think of law as just an academic pursuit. It okay. became a real in a way that it hadn't been before. I understood why I was doing all this other stuff. Tell me how that happened in the clinic. What, what formed you in that uh, initially with initial interviews I was assigned to do initial interviews mm -hmm. and for the most part uh, Colonel Peckham who was the head of that clinic and is a well-known figure from the University of Georgia Law School uh, would just assign the new kid on the block to do initial interviews because they weren't terribly important they'd come back 
that person would then come back in with the client and have another conversation with Peckham and essentially go the same stuff. Um, I got real serious about doing these interviews well. And eventually Peckham let me know that he respected what I was doing mm -hmm. and um, that I was picking up things that, that he wasn't. That meant a great deal to me. And nobody had given me any indication that I was going to be particularly good at doing any of this. And I kind of realized that there was a great deal of people skilled involved in this. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something foreign. And started thinking in those terms. I liked studying the law. I didn't have any objection to that. But that was trying to continue in the kind of academic pursuit that goes all the way back to study hall. Right. Um, actually, the law became much more interesting to me much later on, mm -hmm. it, as you and I have talked about in various settings, an acquired taste that, uh, um, it, yeah. yeah, but um, so that's why that was uh, formative and, and I was very, very lucky. Um, there were a few others of us who were interested in legal services. John Cromarty, I don't know mm -hmm. if you've ever heard the name. Sure. Uh, John was the, uh, in some ways the father of uh, legal services in Georgia, and Father George, the first director of Georgia Legal Services, but more than that, in some ways the founder, with Bucky's help, with mm -hmm. Bucky Askew's help. Bucky was on the legal services board. Um, and uh, So I anyhow, um, uh, John came to the interview, he was doing all his own interviews, he was handpicking people uh, to place them. I go into the interview, the first interview that I had had with anyone um, since leaving the Marine Corps. You know. I go into the interview with John not knowing what to expect and his first question to me was, Jack, which office would you like to work at? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good day. It's a good day and I took that as a sign that I was where I was supposed to be. Uh -huh. um, he said, yeah, I'll tell you truthfully that uh, probably ought to go to um, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to build the Gainesville office. I've, got, I've selected a bunch of people there that I like a lot. I think it's going to be a good office. It's a lot for John to say that, um, a lot for him to offer me Gainesville because that was his hometown. His dad had been the mayor of um, Gainesville and he really wanted the Gainesville office. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh gosh, yeah, if he wants to be there, that's where I, sh I should go. <laughs> I went to Gainesville. Yeah. Um, before we get into that, that phase, I want to did, go back. Uh, the, let me, before I forget it, and at one point, I was on the same side, litigation sides, with a, uh, someone who was older than I was. I guess he was older, um, but uh, still a fairly young lawyer in Gainesville, um, Nathan Deal. <laughs> <laughs> and. and, and, and uh, who, who went on to other things? Other things. I was going to say infamy. <laughs> well, At the, least in some circles. In the Congress and the governor's mansion, among other things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm going back to this uh, business of it being a formative experience. Try to uh, ask you just a little bit more about that. I mean, was was part of it that. You you met real people, mm -hmm. I and mean, that's a client sitting in front of you, and that's different from the the, a, the academic side that you were familiar with. Not as a separation of theory and practice. It, um, not that. Um, I did not, uh, as a result of the clinic, as some people do, discount the experience I was getting in the classroom. Right. No, I didn't mean that. It's a bit, it's but it was surprising to you in some way. It, it was, was a connection. Okay. It was, it was how theory and practice merged. And an initial insight became clearer to me later on how uh, theory emerged out of practice. Mm -hmm. um, so I, everything, um, there's a famous Robert Frost line that about um, momentary coherences. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of those that in the clinic everything sort of fell into place. Made sense. Made sense. The whole thing made sense. So, although, I don't want to say the whole thing made sense, I want to say it made sense in a way that allowed you to evaluate too. Mm -hmm. 
uh, what parts of the other experience didn't make sense. And, uh, um, but there was a coherence there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other part of it you mentioned was that it called upon a part of you that wasn't the, the academic side, the people skills yeah. part of that. And that, that had just had not been uh, called upon so much. It didn't really, yeah. Like most people, I just didn't realize that, um, didn't have a personal, I had an intellectual realization of what lawyers did, but a personal one, that mm -hmm. um, you're serving people. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, 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 and we've both been law teachers long enough to know that the, the, the thing that's most often absent from a law school classroom is the client. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't exist without clients. I do really. think that um, if there had been clients in the classroom, that that coherence would have come earlier. And that rather than that being a threat to the classroom, it would have been, it would have uh, intensified and my desire to do well what was being, uh, what yeah. we were being asked to do. Yeah, and, and yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. That when that coherence comes, it lights a fire. It does. Yeah. That, yep. that and just... you can, and it lights a fire and gives you a way of thinking about your future. Mm -hmm. So we're always projecting a self into the future. Very difficult to do that in law school. I didn't know who this self is a lawyer. I could. I, mean, I could talk about it abstractly, I can imagine it, mm -hmm. but to feel it, to feel that, mm -hmm. well, yeah, there is a person there that I am becoming. Mm -hmm. And um, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms, but with your good questions, that I think that's what it was. Um, to see a way forward, mm -hmm. yeah. With some, some degree of clarity. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And then also that I wasn't being asked to change so much as asked to develop mm -hmm. in a particular way to be sure. But um, so, I mean, I didn't want to be different than the way I was. I didn't want to become something called a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem that you and I have talked about and talked with students about. Uh, there wasn't a lawyer identity that I wanted as my own. But suddenly, um, I could see this as consistent mm -hmm. with the narrative of my own life. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very valuable. Not to say that I knew uh, what to do as a lawyer. In fact, sure. we'll get to that in a second, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but my uh, initial exposure to practice was um, frightening, mm -hmm. as, especially in legal services, because there were almost no mentors around at the time. Right. Um, it, it, one of the things that's interesting to me is that this moment came for you in, in clinic and um, I'm searching my mind for other ways that students, you know, have that, that moment of, of clarity. Uh, well, you'll, you'll notice that um, that then becomes consistent with a lot of what to follow. <laughs> Right. That uh, why I came to Mercer as director of clinical education, but also why I, I, after a few years as associate dean, and then started working on the Woodruff, that the that theme continues. Mm -hmm. But it's now Woodruff, in my uh, thinking of it, was uh, in some ways an attempt to offer that kind of experience to everyone right. as a progression through law school. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, it's that echoes, essential. Yeah, e e echoes yeah. later on. Um, I think that you know logically, the next thing to talk about, I, I suppose, is your transition into practice, and, and you you describe it as as frightening, um, I, traumatic. I, yeah, much yeah. worse than law school, much worse than Vietnam. Okay. <laughs> um, we we uh, it we we probably ought to. Uh, the break we've been going about an hour and this okay. is a good uh, uh, breaking point but you know, come back in a few minutes and talk about you know those those first few months and what that was like okay sounds good um, uh, I, I, you do know Pat that I've just spent about nine months in uh, Vermont uh, we're out in the woods and I don't talk to anybody so I've already talked more than I have in nine months <laughs> but if you want more we'll keep going all right very good <laughs>